Welcome to Building While Flying, a Sasha Group podcast where we interview business leaders about how they tackle challenges, stay resilient, and navigate ever-changing skies. Welcome back to another episode of Building While Flying. On this week's episode, Joe speaks with Jeremy Hill founder and managing partner of JB Capital, an alternative asset management firm investing in areas of the market underserved by traditional banks. So Jeremy has been pretty involved in in a lot of our products for a while. So it was nice to have him on and and hear his story. Um, So what do you think makes Jeremy a different type of investor? Yeah, Jeremy's been a good friend of the company. Um, I'd say there's a number of different things that makes him a unique type of investor. Um, number one, that he didn't take, uh, you know, a, a traditional approach to where he's been, where he has, you know, ended up now. You know, there's all the trappings and the cliches that people talk about when they talk about VCs and bankers. Uh, you've got to go to this type of school. You've got to do things this type of way. You've got to wear this type of uh, outfit or clothing. And, um, you know, none, none of that stuff really worked for Jeremy. He talks about how he went through uh, the motions of trying to do things uh, the, the prototypical way, and he wound up being really bad at it. You know, he wound up uh, having something like 13 jobs over the course of a couple of years or something like that. And then that's really what propelled him to decide to go out on his own and become an entrepreneur and start his own business and and really kind of, you know, start to bring his own thoughts to the marketplace. You know, he's also a very, you know, self-effusive kind of character. Uh, not, he doesn't really have a lot of hubris. Uh, and I think when he thinks about the future of lending and, uh, you know, the ability to give people credit versus necessarily just stick them with an equity deal and start taking on, um, taking over, or taking on certain aspects and elements of their company, um, I really do feel like he's a little more purpose built. He wants to see entrepreneurs keep as much equity as possible. And he wants to be a small part on the road to their way to success. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think a lot of our listeners can take a page out of his Jeremy's and Phil Knight's book. And instead of doing what they think they should do, um, just do it. So let's not keep our listeners waiting any longer. Let's dive into Joe's episode with Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about you and JB Capital and what brought you to where you're at today. Well, you know, I mean, I, I'd love to say that it's a, uh, um, you know, a beautiful, wonderful, planned, happy story that, you know, uh, you know, I went to school and I got a great education. I got a good job and, you know, I got a house with a picket fence and a Jeep Cherokee and a golden retriever. And yeah, it's, it's about the exact, like, opposite. Like, exact opposite. Uh, my, my story is more, you know, run really fast. And when you hit something, turn. Right. <laughs> so, Sounds like uh, how parents teach their kids how to like train for the Olympics. Just don't run into that wall. Don't yeah, fall off don't, that balance beam. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think like like most, I always had a, a little bit of a um, a bug to do something more. Um, to do something more, you know, define mm-hmm. more as you will. Something mm-hmm. not average. Something not routine. And mm-hmm. you know, through one path or another, it is it led me to uh, kind of venturing out on my own. Um, my wife and I got married young. And so mm-hmm. by young, I mean young and we were, you know, young and broke and stupid and trying to, fig- <laughs> and trying to figure stuff out and you kind of don't know. And so ultimately I think it is, um, you know, I found myself in a series of jobs, um, neither of which I was, you know, or none of which I was very good at. Um, we ended up starting our first company, which was a wireless phone company way back in the day. And my partner, um, at the time it is in the business was new and young and married and I drank and drank beer. I was new and young and married and also drank beer. And that was about <laughs> the totality of the business plan back then. Right. And so we grew that business from, from, from Michael and I to, uh, you know, us plus two plus 20 plus 40 plus about 60 or 70 folks. Um, and was a good business. Um, yeah. Wife got pregnant, realized quickly it is that, uh, you know, I needed to, uh, um, uh, you know, have health insurance, you know, that might be good, you know, as a dad to be, we should probably get some of that health insurance. I should wear a tie. I should get one of those little badges, you know, that you know, <laughs> hangs on my belt that buzzes me into the building and I should be responsible and, and uh, quickly found that um, I was not very good at that. I had uh, 13 jobs in about two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, you know, through this course of events, realized I was for something else. Um, yeah. Ended up starting a business kind of by default, which today became JB Capital 20 years later. So again, like 
most people have a, you know, a planned one, two, three paint by numbers, happy story. Mine was not that, but it's turned out to be a, a, a kind of a beautiful, uh, happy accident. There you go. So your whole career has been about the pivot and changing and adapting. Yeah, it has been. I mean, kind of fast forward, you know, to today, our, our business. So my company, JB Capital, um, we provide, you know, flexible, creative kind of capital for growing companies across the country. Right. And so that started in the investment banking kind of capital markets business about 20 years ago to where we were kind of a hired gun to help companies go solve problems. Mm-hmm. Most of those problems had something to do with something to do with money. Yeah. Um, and that kind of evolved now to where what it, what we had been doing historically alongside banks and, and family offices and other investors right. were doing off of my balance sheet and, and raising capital and, and trying to make a dent, trying to make a difference. Yeah. So, and I saw that uh, on your website, you mentioned that you're hundred percent focused on credit now. Um, explain that to the audience a little bit. What uh, caused you to shift into a hundred percent focus on credit? And um, I, I did notice from uh, kind of looking at some of your videos on Vimeo, it seemed like 2021 was a good year for you guys. So it seems like the, the strategy is paying off a little bit. Uh, why don't you go into detail a little bit on the strategy uh, to focus on credit and then uh, talk to us about how that uh, applied to your year in 2021? Sure. You got it. So credit is, you know, there's, there's different ways it is to, to finance companies, right? Fundamentally, kind of the basics are, you know, it's either done with debt or equity, right? And it's most kind of simple rudimentary forms, right? And debt in a number of different flavors is basically credit. And it can be, you know, done a bunch of different ways. We think it is that we, you know, do it pretty good. But basically, we, we rent money in its simplest words, right? So just like a bank or just like a private lender of sorts, it is I'm renting money or loaning money to growing companies with the hopes it is to God, you know, to get it back, right? You know, um, equity investors are looking at companies it is and they're coming in and they're saying, great, I'm going to put, you know, uh, you know, a hundred grand or a million dollars or $10 million into Joe's software business with the right with the thoughts it is that the value of Joe's software business is gonna go from A to B over a certain period of time, thus the value of my equity is going to increase as well. Right? Mm-hmm. From, a, from a credit perspective, credit is basically it is, I am going to, to attach a degree of kind of security and I'm going to loan you money, not necessarily take equity interest in your business, but you're going to rent that money from me or rent that equity from me and pay me sure. a monthly or quarterly or annual dividend uh, or you know, interest payback. On that, right? yeah. Right. That's that. That's the fundamental difference for for me when I look at this is that I look at at debt like dating and I look at equity <laughs> like kind of getting married. Right. You know, in a <laughs> most simple form. Right. So when when I'm looking at equity investors that come into a business, I, I look at that like like getting married. Right. You more likely than not, most people don't marry the first person it is that they date. Right. Sure. And you need to put a, a hell of a lot more. Uh, 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 focus and thought into who you are going to be as a life partner, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing's true for your business, right? If I'm going to right. give up more percent of equity, it is in my business to, you know, Bob, the investor, I'm going to put a lot more diligence on that rather than if I'm just going to borrow money, right? Right. You and I all know somebody it is who uh, uh, has been married, that, you know, two years, five years, 20 years later, they've unfortunately gotten divorced, right? Mm-hmm. And that divorce from choosing the wrong partner Destroys them. Can wreck your finances. Yep. It can wreck your family. It can screw up your kids. It can. I mean, it can. It can wreak havoc across all aspects of your life. Mm-hmm. The the exact same thing is true if you choose the wrong equity partner for your business, right? Right. Thankfully for me in my marriage, my wife is a freaking rock star, right? And so I've been able to do things because I chose the right partner that maybe I couldn't have done without doing so. Right. From a from a debt perspective, debt's kind of like dating. Right. Like we can choose to go out for a while. And if, you know, six months later, we don't like each other anymore, then you can go out with somebody else next Friday night. Right. That kind <laughs> of a thing. Right. You. So for us, when we're looking at a credit perspective in these businesses, we are coming in and we're writing kind of one to three year loans. So we are not, you know, a six month overnight bridge lender. And I'm not, you know, five, seven, 10 year private equity. So we are not, we're not a one night stand and we're not a marriage proposal. We're kind of us. <laughs> <laughs> kind of somewhere in the middle, right? right? Somewhere in the middle. And so for us from an investment standpoint, the way it is that we've figured out a way to to structure how it is that we do our debt, it does a couple things. For our investors and myself, 
Um, I feel like it is that we've found a way it is to deliver equity level returns with all of the protections of being a lender, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is done well for us and well for our investors. From a portfolio company standpoint, we're working with the, and you know several of these folks, but from a portfolio company standpoint, we're allowing these folks it is to get access to, to capital and to partnerships and to opportunities to grow without necessarily having to, to dilute their interest or to give up equity. Not that mm -hmm. we necessarily don't deserve it, but, but there, are, there are far too many folks in this business it is that um, are looking out for their best interest, you know, and really not trying to help these guys. And so, uh, yeah, I was about to ask you that just um, the difference between, you know, you, you talk a lot about why, uh, why a company should be interested in VCs versus a, a lender. Um, talk to me from your perspective, though, when you're looking at places to put your money, does it change? You know, I know you've done, you've worked on both sides of the fence before, but like, how does it shift your mindset when you think about putting money in with the goal of getting a piece of the company out versus putting money in to get money out in over a short term horizon or a medium term horizon? Does that give you more? Um, I would imagine it would, um, you know, with, with the way that VCs are looking at companies and when they're planning on selling and taking a, you know, larger check or going IPO or something like that, they're betting on, the 1% of the 1% of technology type people out there versus are you able to kind of go a little bit down into the middle market and put some bets onto some trustworthy individuals and, and kind of uh, take that strategy to market a little bit versus going out and, and jockeying over the, the same uh, all-star, you know, um, you know, tech companies or software companies that are coming about. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I don't think that the, uh, the bloom is off the rose, you know, necessarily for the, the, the venture capital market, there's going to, you know, I would expect to be a long tail in that business and continue to do so. I do think, however, that entrepreneurs and small businesses uh, have gotten a little bit smarter, right? Like the, these guys would rather pay a premium to rent my money rather than, you know, mm -hmm. uh, give up 20% of their, you know, business to some kid in San Francisco with a Patagonia vest, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> like God right. bless that guy, right? But we, we're certainly seeing it is over the last several years that a lot of the VCs in that community are beginning to drive economics and make decisions. And it's kind of the tail wagging the dog a little bit because they want to drive economics in that portfolio company to get a good return to look good in next year's pitch deck when they go out and raise next year's funds, right? And so it's a little bit perverse on the fact that the investor is looking in their best interest to substantiate their position for next year or two year or three or whatever to go raise more money and do it again, um, which may not necessarily be the best thing for what that company is going through at that period of time. And I think it is that, that business owners and entrepreneurs are being aware of that. And so in that VC world, the old kind of, you know, fundamental deal here is I'm going to look at a hundred companies to invest in, you know, five or 10, the five or 10 it is that I invest in of those 10, eight are going to go to shit. One's going to do okay. And one is going to hopefully, you know, shoot the lights out and, and, right. and that, that will make up for the loss or the, the mediocre losses. performance of the other six, seven, eight, whatever it is companies. Right. Think mm -hmm. about those metrics in the, any other business. You'd be fired, right? Anybody that's one from 10 from the free throw line? Yeah, dude, you're on the bench. Right? Right. You know, right. yeah. like, no, it doesn't work in any other business. And so how it is that we reward that makes no sense to me. But there's such a gobsmack right. of money chasing that and chasing that because I want to be a part of the next, you know, this, that, or the other thing. It is That to me doesn't make sense for me. The way it is that we look at things are we are really focusing on this, uh, what you call the lower middle market. These are companies typically under $100 million in revenue that have some type of finance or credit or borrowing need between kind of two and 20 million, right? We, we're really focused on these companies it is that you've heard me say are kind of past that friends and family, mom and dad would jump around to raising money, but they're really not yet to a point to where institutional capital can afford to pay attention to them. 
right? So if Joe and Jeremy don't need to borrow 20 or 40 or 50 or 100 million, we need to borrow two or six or seven or eight or whatever it is, that kind of two and six and seven, that's a really scary check for like the local rich guy to do by himself. But the majority of people in London or New York or Chicago that have institutional money, they don't give a shit about writing a $3 million check, right? Like $3 million is the is the fee income. It's not the deal size, right? Like $3 million is our travel and expense budget for the year. It's not, it's not the size of the investment that I'm making. And so... It's the money to pay the assistant yeah, of the assistant. Totally, man. Yeah, you got it, <laughs> the assistant of the assistant. And so there... There is this just massive growing burgeoning group of companies across the country now that are kind of finding themselves in purgatory, right? Like they, they need something different than what their, their, their banker and their rich uncle can do. But the guy in Chicago that just raised $2 billion last week, who has the experience to help him that even if he, even if he wants to, he really actually can't stop for long enough and actually pay attention to him because he has too much money. And so we've really found this need here for these growing companies, a lot of which you and I and James have kind of gone back and forth and talked to, that there is a huge need for some smart money to come in and help these guys. Yeah, I mean, you sound like uh, if anybody out there listening has paid attention to the Sasha Group story, you sound like the Sasha Group of the capital well, world. <laughs> just you know, about really. When, what I, when I saw you a month ago, right, is that kind of for what what Sasha has done in in – in the, the marketing world, we've kind of taken that same approach it is towards towards deploying capital, right? So hopefully if we have a modicum of y'all's success, we'll be in great shape. Yeah, no, so let's switch gears then and talk about um, the current state of affairs in the future a little bit, because I feel like the uh, people that are listening to, this, to the Building While Flying podcast uh, are at the very least interested in learning from the Sasha Group, if not actually doing business with us. So, um, you know, the Fed just made a little adjustment. Uh, talk to us about what's going to be happening in 22 as a result of that. I know we've been riding high from an economic perspective for about a decade and a half since the last Great Recession. But uh, what do you see happening in 2022 and, and how might our listeners, um, you know, kind of really dive into this uh, year uh, without too much uh, panic? Our business and where it is that we see credit from how it is that we work a rise in interest rates is only going to do positive things for our business. So as perverse as that might say, or perverse as that might sound is that, you know, the majority of lenders, banks included, operate on a uh, either a LIBOR plus or a prime plus, you know, X, Y, Z to, to determine their interest rates. Right. And so as you see a climb, you're going to see the cost of borrowing from either your local bank or a BDC or other private lender. You're going to see that cost of capital is going to go up. Right. And so at where it is that we loan, what ends up happening there is that degree of kind of margin between a bank's money and my money now becomes less. And so we actually become more attractive. Mm -hmm. So for us, mm -hmm. I think honestly, it is we'll get better swings at bat for uh, um, even even better companies. Right. I think that's one. I think the oh, other nice. thing it is that we look at right now um, this year is that we're going to see a lot of movement, I think. And again, I'm not an economist, so so you know, put some Surgeon General warning on this statement or something, right? But um, I do think it is that we're going to see some movement out of the equity markets this year, right? Is that we? It does seem to be kind of long in the tooth. It is for public equities. This last couple of years, we've had everything from massive kind of political and social movement and unrest and craziness. We've had the COVID and coronavirus stuff going on. We've now got a war going on in Ukraine and whatever kind of, you know, marination of all these things kind of coming. If we look at what's happened in the equity markets over the last couple of years, uh, you know, add unemployment, add, add, add all this kind of thing. Equity markets are just kind of up and to the right. Right. You know, and so you're kind of like, mm -hmm. it almost seems like two plus two equals potato. Like it just, that doesn't make sense. Like something at some point right. has got to give. And so uh, I think there'll be a movement out of there searching for yield somewhere else. Um, when you begin to look at private equity, I think private equity uh, and the venture capital market, there's a ton of dough there that's going to continue to have a long run. But I think that there is kind of perverse economics happening because as you dive in and begin to look at that, you realize that not every company is worth 25 times earnings. It's just not, it's just not, right? So folks are gonna be looking for some type of um, a yield or income instrument somewhere. I think private credit is a, is a good hope for that. I think a lot of people are gonna move to cash, um, which candidly is, makes you feel good 
to have, you know, five grand, 10 grand, a hundred grand, a million bucks in the bank, whatever, you know, whoever's listening, right. It makes you feel good. The reality is the value of that cash in a rising interest rate environment is diminishing in value every day. Right. So you need to figure out a way for that, for that cash as an idle asset to do something that's either increasing your wealth, increasing your assets or increasing your income, right? Like each of those little hundred dollar bills as a soldier, you got to take that soldier and put him to work to go to work for you to do something else. That's kind of what it is that I see going on here. So for us, as we're continuing to grow, I want to continue to uh, um, increase the number of portfolio investments it is that we have, um, not only from a diversification standpoint, but I, I want my capital working. Like I want my capital going in and helping these companies grow, regardless of whether it is that there is a war or Biden is president or whoever the next president is this, I don't care. Right. I, I, I want my capital at work. So speaking about that, you mentioned cash with the rise of inflation being so sharp this year, should, you know, people be looking at, at cash the same way as they maybe did five, 10 years ago. And, you know, to the other end of the spectrum, like, you know, there's a massive rise in, in uh, crypto and uh, alternative investing out there right now. Should be, people be looking at that as an alternative vehicle to park some money to diversify, uh, you know, what kind of money that they're sitting on? Yeah, top of? I mean, again, for for me, cash is, is, you know, again, it's one of those things that is that makes you feel good. But sitting on cash is purely just that. It just makes you feel good. Um, there is, I mean, look at this. There's a, a recent maybe 30, 60 days ago it is article it is that Ray Dalio put out talk about cash is trash, right? And how to be looking at that in a, in a, in a rising inflationary economy. For other assets, um, I have I, I have looked at crypto from afar. Um, I know how to spell mm. NFT, right? Thanks to Gary. But outside of that, <laughs> you know, Gary has done, I think yesterday, yesterday or day before, kind of a big, um, you know, senior thesis on kind of getting behind and understanding the value of NFTs. So I defer to him. Uh, or to you guys on that, yeah. on, on crypto, look at that thing as kind of a, a potential item for diversification, but that needs to be at risk capital purely because of the volatility. Like I wouldn't have my kids. Yeah. Don't put all yeah, of your yeah, money yeah. in it. Just right. as in anything, right? Like even, even the investors that have big stakes sure. with us, I tell them, you shouldn't give anybody all of your money, including me and candidly, right. including yourself. Yeah. Right? You shouldn't. Right. So, um, Right now, I would definitely look at opportunities for diversification outside the equity markets this year. I do think that they're, I don't think the music is going to stop necessarily. Like we're going to have a 25%, you know, sell off kind of like 2008. I don't think that is going to happen, mm -hmm. but, but there right. will be some adjustment, whatever the hell that means. Right. And, um, you know, I think we'll close off on uh, not necessarily a last question, but kind of a last category. I want to talk about, you know, where your interest is lie heading into the next few years. I mean, I've always been fascinated at the way VCs look at markets and where they choose to put their money beyond just the individual investments, but kind of speaking more broadly, uh, you know, I think a lot of people out there uh, became fans of, of Mary Meeker back when she was at, at Kleiner Perkins and have followed her career. I used to look at the state of the internet report every year when it came out and just look at how she understood how broadband uh, internet was going to exponentially increase throughout the world and, you know, mobile device uh, penetration, multi-household, uh, multi-device penetration per household around the world. And I'd look at these metrics as a key indicator of, well, shit, I should be out there actively uh, instructing all of my teams to invest in digital video because that, it seems like, is where the world is headed right now. Uh, and a lot of people have used uh, the knowledge and, and wisdom of people like yourself and people like Mary to, to kind of figure out how to fine tune their service businesses or understand how, uh, you know, consumer demand was going to shake out. So where, what kind of uh, industries and verticals are you looking at right now as the economy is changing that are going to be, you know, uh, paying dividends for yourself in the next uh, 10 to 20 years? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the the fundamental things it is that aren't going to change right is is technology and kind of the advancements of technology across broad spectrum are going to uh, continue to be here right like even though when you and i watch future movies of mad max and this kind of stuff we're all going to go live in the dirt and drive big dune buggies and stuff like that don't see that <laughs> happening probably in my lifetime but um, the advancements of of technology and software are going to continue to be there so i 
definitely see us playing in there for us as a as a lender and investor i kind of like the the business to business aspect of technology and software more than the b2c aspect of things um i see yep. healthcare as definitely having a long tail um for sure. so for us and in our investments is going to be in kind of health tech and med tech um i don't do biotech drug discovery life sciences so less on the yes, pharmaceutical yeah, side yeah, more on the device, device, device side and don't pretend to be right so um <laughs> but i see telehealth having a long tail like the telehealth business has been around a mm -hmm. dozen years and now we've we've seen as a result of COVID, telehealth blend into everything from uh, marriage and family therapy to veterinary medicine to mental health to all sorts of stuff. I see that having a long tail. The other right. two things it is that are a big focus for us that I think aren't going to go anywhere anytime soon is number one, communication, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. think about Zoom, you know, three years ago, four years ago was like one out of every 25 meetings. And now we're wondering why the hell would I fly to New York when I can just jump on a Zoom and see Joe, right? You know, right? Something real yeah, quick. Right. That has changed as this kind of evolution and proliferation in advancements of technology, whether it's 5G or video or, or you know, something else, that's going to continue to ad advance and expand. Um, the other thing that's going to continue to advance and expand, um, I believe, is kind of the EV world. We've made a few EV investments. It is. Mm -hmm. Um, that I'm excited about and are now looking at kind of the EV supply right. supply chain it is to support that. If you look, you know, five years ago, Tesla was kind of the, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, you know, I'd never bet against Elon. I like that dude. But you've now <laughs> seen Lucid and Waymo and every major car manufacturer is now moving towards this evolution in, in electric vehicles, right? Um, right? That is going to continue. Uh, that's going to continue on. Um both from kind of a, a necessity and kind of a um, a government government mandate of pushing pushing that way with them putting so much money behind that that that's going to be here for a long ways. So those are some opportunities I see in kind of the next you know three four five years to where we're spending time. Selfishly, because I run a division of the Sasha Group called the mm -hmm. Education Division, uh, what are your feelings on uh, you know you mentioned communications, but how are you know education, adult education, continued learning, uh, utilization of communications. I imagine there's going to be tons of uh, software companies cropping up to help teach people in a, in a kind of 2025 type of way now that all this stuff is happening. Have you considered um, advancements in educations as uh, yeah. not necessarily the public sector, but yeah, the private a thousand sector? Percent. I think it is that, you know, Gary's talked about this a lot. We actually just did a couple of interviews on this that'll come out to where um, even for my own kids, right? So I have I have my eldest son as a sophomore going into his junior year in university, and then I've got my daughter and my youngest son right behind that, right? And so we're looking at now what is the the um, today version of the value of education, and is it worth you know two hundred thousand dollars for your kid to go to an, you know get an undergrad? Um, <laughs> likely for most two things. Likely for most people and for most families, either number one that's not an option, or number two. No, it's not a value, right? Like we, we talk about all the right. time, right? Like if I have a heart attack today and go to the hospital, the guy that's cutting my chest open, God, I hope he went to a good school and did well on his MCATs, right? And didn't drink the night before my <laughs> surgery, right? Or if I'm getting sued and go to court, man, my attorney better be a badass, right? But if it's, if it's something different that is not that, the, the, the universities and what it is that they're charging for that experience, um, I'm not sure is worth it. So when you begin to look at like a couple of years ago, I think Google and Apple and a lot of these major employers came out and said they no longer require a degree uh, for any of their, their applications. Google came out with like a, like a, a Google U or something like this to where they're now offering certification sure. courses that if you finish course one, two, three, four, five, then you're guaranteed some job at Google somewhere kind of a thing that I think is going to mm -hmm. continue um, to grow and to be more evident. We saw 10 years ago kind mm -hmm. of this kind of growth and proliferation of kind of Udemy and the Khan Academy and these kinds of things to where mm -hmm. you and I can go on and become more learned on something that I actually care about learning about, not just some guy from a pulpit preaching me something that I don't give a shit about, but I got to check it to graduate, right? Um, right. So what you're doing in that space for kind of the private education market, whether it's software or business or social media or otherwise, that's not going anywhere. So I, I think you're in a great right. spot. Awesome. Well, I think we're at time. So thank you very much for joining us on the Building Wealth Line podcast.